Hatred or greed Paradise is the place we need I feel the peace inside of me Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues where we discuss the issues of common interest to the monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Today's episode is going to focus on atheism. I'm going to start with F.W. Norwood's quote, life's greatest tragedy is to lose God and not to miss him. Atheists claim that they can explain our existence through science, through the Big Bang, through evolution, and because these explanations satisfy them. Now, I have addressed this before in my talk on the big questions, but I would like to address it again. In a nutshell, the problem is that by these explanations of the Big Bang and evolution, science contradicts science. Why? because it's a general principle of science to believe in the concept of entropy. Entropy is the principle that everything degenerates into chaos unless it is controlled. Unless there is a higher power exerting control over a process, it degenerates into chaos. Now, it does not matter if you are talking about your child's bedroom, the kitchen sink, or a complex chemical reaction. If there is nothing controlling it, it will degenerate into chaos. If nobody picks up the child's bedroom, it will become a mess. If nobody cleans the dishes in the kitchen sink, they will just pile up. And if nobody controls a chemical reaction, it will do whatever it does, sometimes leading to disaster. If there is no control over a process, it degenerates into chaos. And so, over all processes which lead to an organized result, there is a greater power exerting control over it. We are told to believe that the Big Bang, the most cataclysmic event in history, in which all the matter and energy of the universe drew together into a hyperdense core and exploded outward into a universe that is 240 followed by 21 zeros miles across. And this occurred by chance, and this explosion resulted not in chaos, but in perfection, with balanced orbits, with a billion galaxies, over a billion galaxies, none of them colliding with one another, that's a pretty tall tale. At the same time, we are told that evolution was a process by which, through exposure to the primordial elements, amino acids were derived, basic building blocks of proteins, which developed into a single-cell organism, a single cell organism evolved over millions of years to the various organisms we now have, and that explains the diversity of life as we know it. Again, another process that without a higher control overseeing that process, we would expect to degenerate into chaos, not into perfection. And yet this is what atheists believe. The cataclysmic event of the Big Bang, the millions of years of uncontrolled random evolution led not to chaos, but to perfection. That is pretty unbelievable. It is for that reason that many scientists in recent years have disavowed the concept of evolution and have attached the label intelligent design, a conclusion that none of this could have happened without being overseen by a greater power. Now, there are other issues. For example, 
Evolution, or natural selection, can explain the diversity of species. It can explain why horses a million years ago were this tall, and now they are that tall. It can explain where the dinosaurs came from and where they went to. It can explain many things, but what it cannot explain is the existence of the soul. If you believe in a soul, where did that come from? And how could that possibly have evolved? If you look at a living organism, all living organisms have something else that is undeniable, and that is life. They have life. Where did that come from? When an organism dies, when an animal dies, the organs are frequently still functioning. Brain death is not always instantaneous. If the organs are still functioning, why is the body dead? Where did the life go to? And where did it come from? We as human beings can transplant almost every organ in the body. We can assemble a Frankenstein-like creature, but nobody can give it life. Not all the scientists in the world can assemble the wing of a gnat. We cannot assemble the smallest organism in creation and give it life. Where did that come from? So the theory of evolution can explain many things, but there are also some quintessential elements to life that it cannot explain. Having said that, there's the old and famous quote that there are no atheists in a foxhole, meaning that everybody at some point in their life enters a period of panic, a period where, for whatever reason, they are thrown into panic and desperation. And at those moments, you never find anybody calling upon anything except for their creator. Oh, God, help me. O oh God this, O oh God that. But it is always O oh God, even from the lips of an atheist. The English poet, Elizabeth Browning, in The Cry of the Human, had two very beautiful lines. And lips say, God be pitiful, who ne'er said, God be praised. There will come a time when all of mankind stands on the day of judgment, and those who never praised God will ask God to be merciful. They never praised God, but they will ask God to be merciful. How do they expect mercy from a God they never recognized and never worshipped? The prayer of a skeptic is a good starting place. Those of you who know my conversion story, how I became religious, know that it started with the prayer of the skeptic. I didn't know this prayer had a name at that time. The prayer I prayed was, oh God, if you are there. I didn't even know. I was an atheist. Many people think that I was a Christian, and I came to Islam through Christianity. That was never the case. I was an atheist who became religious, searched for the truth, could not find it in Christianity, but who did find it in Islam. I was the atheist who prayed, oh God, if you are there, because I didn't know. But I did make the prayer. Oh God, if you are there, help me and guide me. And I promised that if God guided me to the religion that was most pleasing to him, that I would follow. And that is a prayer anybody can pray. Call upon our Creator in just that way. Our Creator, if you are there, guide me and I will follow. So, we look to the past, we find some famous people speaking on this subject, Francis Bacon, quote, I had rather believe all the fables in the legend, and the Talmud, and the Al-Quran, than that this universal frame is without a mind, stating that he would rather believe everything in all of the books of scripture than to believe that this vast creation is without a creator. He went on to comment, God never wrought miracle 
to convince atheism? Because his ordinary works convince it. The more a person learns about the creation and the intricacies of life, the intricacies of organisms, the more they realize that this could not have happened by happenstance. Again, if we turned the processes of evolution loose, how can we expect them to lead to perfection rather than to chaos? We look at a building, we know that there's an architect. We look at a sculpture, we know that there is a sculptor. We look at a painting, we know that there is a painter. Why is it that when we look at creation, we do not recognize that there is a creator? Well, many people fail to make sense of certain aspects of this life which they perceive as being ungodly. They say, oh, how could there be a God if such and such a tragedy happened? But who are we to question the methodology of our Creator? Yes, there are some babies who die. Then again, there's the old saying, those who God loves die young. Can anybody make sense of that? I can. Makes sense to me. If any human being who was able to cognitively understand the question was asked, what would you prefer now, to continue on in this life or go directly to paradise this instant? And if they understood what paradise entails and what remaining upon this life entails, they would instantly close on the offer. So can I understand the death of a young person, tragic as it might be? In my viewpoint, that is not a death, it's a transition to the next life, the next existence, which if it is paradise, only a fool would refuse it. If it is hellfire, only a fool would rush toward it. Now we're going to take a short break. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Is the place we need. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown continuing this episode of interfaith issues. We are discussing atheism and we left off with speaking about the fact that there are many issues that atheists raise to say how can this tragedy happen and there still be a God. And I was just pointing out that not all tragedies are necessarily a tragedy for the individual. The young person who dies and goes to paradise, if they were asked from paradise whether it was a tragedy that they transitioned from worldly life to paradise, they would be sure to say no, it was not a tragedy. For them it was a blessing. So it all is a matter of perspective. Another matter of perspective that I think we need to remember is that within this worldly life, it was always God's favorites who suffered the greatest afflictions. It was the prophets who suffered the greatest tests, who developed the patience of Job, for example, because of the afflictions upon them. We know the prophets to have suffered greatly in worldly terms. They were humiliated by their people. They were at times tortured. They were at times killed. There, some of them had children who died in their arms. And so, we have to understand that the reward for piety and righteousness is not necessarily found in this life. Indeed, this life is a test. This life is a test. This life is a trial. It is a proving ground for us to show ourselves deserving of the reward in the hereafter. But now, if we expect paradise in this life, why should we expect paradise in the hereafter. No. Paradise is something to be earned. And you earn something through difficulty, through overcoming difficulty, not through living life as a party. So, remembering that some of those who suffered the most in this life were in fact the prophets, the favorites of our Creator, reminds us that there might be a higher logic, a higher understanding 
to the events that we look at and consider as being tragic. Maybe there is another way of looking at them which makes godly sense. And it is finding that way of looking at them that helps a person to make sense of not only God, but his creation and our purpose of being. One thing I would point out is that nobody, nobody concludes a happy event with a tragedy and considers it a good day. Nobody goes out to a wonderful night on the town, gets mugged at the end of it, and concludes, wow, that was great, I want to do it again. Nobody has the most wonderful of experiences at the end of which it ends in some horrific tragedy and concludes that that was good. In the same way, we should not look at this life and think of this as a time for play and then find ourselves in the fire in the hereafter. It is not going to be a good conclusion. But as Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, quote, the life of this world is but little comfort in the hereafter. We cannot believe that the transgressors and the criminals, when they suffer their punishment, are going to find comfort from any of the pleasures they achieved in this life. There is not in this life, or at least there is seldom, a free lunch. Everybody knows that if you want to get paid on your job, you have to do the work. If you do not do the work, if you underperform, you get fired. Think about that word and think about what that word means. Where did that word come from? Words do not come from nowhere. A product that is not satisfactory is recycled or destroyed. If we are the creation, we are the product. And if we are not satisfactory, it makes sense that we are the ones who will be in the fire. Again, to quote the Holy Quran, and I have not created, this is Allah speaking, and I have not created jinns and men except that they should serve, and some translations render this, worship me. So that is our job description, our purpose for existence, to serve and worship our Creator. As Francis Bacon commented, quote, they that deny a god destroy man's nobility. For certainly man is of kin to the beasts by his body, and if he be not kin to God by his spirit, he is a base and ignoble creature. So, I think it's important to realize atheism as a belief. We recognize it. We know it's there, but we ask God to save us from it. As I mentioned before, if you don't have baseline belief in God to begin with, it's difficult to pray to something you don't believe in. But how will it hurt anybody who is sincere to pray and ask our Creator if He is there? O oh God, O oh our Creator, if you are there, guide me to the religion of truth, if you are there. And if you are there and if there is a religion of truth, I will follow. How is that going to hurt anybody to pray that prayer? And if you pray it with sincerity, how is it possible to conceive that our Creator would not answer that prayer? We should rightfully move on from this point to discussing not atheism, but agnosticism. And although agnosticism is not a creed, but rather a method, it's a very misunderstood concept. The concept of agnosticism is not belief in God, but not knowing how to believe in God. No, rather the concept of agnosticism is agnostic not knowing, not being able to prove. You know, from the Latin, the A is negating, Gnostic is certain knowledge. It is basically saying that you cannot prove the existence of God.
by this definition, which is not the dictionary definition, but it's the definition according to Thomas Huxley, the one who originated the term, by this definition, a person can be Christian, a person can be Jewish, a person can be Muslim, and still be agnostic in the sense that they recognize God, they believe in God, they serve and worship God, but they do not believe that they can prove the existence of God to another. That is something that has to come from God himself. What brings certainty of God's existence into a person's heart and into a person's mind? Well, religious knowledge is not like other knowledge. It's not purely academic. Of, it is as much a matter of the heart as it is of the intellect. But to have true certainty in religion, that only comes from one place. That is a gift from our Creator. So a person can claim to be atheist, a person can claim to be agnostic and to find those ideologies satisfying. But look, there are many things in life, there are many things in life that are not provable. Gravity. Well, you can drop something and you can find it is still working, but you can't see gravity. By definition, you can't see a black hole, although you can see the evidence that points to its existence. You cannot prove your hunger drive. You cannot prove your headache. You can show the symptoms of it, but you cannot prove it. We arrive at the belief in gravity, entropy, black holes, our emotions, our feelings, and so on, because we either experience them directly or because the overwhelming evidence points to them. And in the same way, I would suggest that the overwhelming evidence points to the existence of a creator. A Bedouin once once asked why he believes in God. And he just answered simply, you know, if I see hoof prints, I know that there has been a sheep or a goat. If I see camel footprints, I know there has been a camel. If, and if I see footprints, I know there has been a human being. And if I look at creation, I know that there is a creator. Well, for those who are uncertain, don't try to solve it yourself. Don't agonize over it. Pray for our creator to solve it for you. Again, oh God, if you are there. Well, in the same way that we accept gravity, entropy, absolute zero, black holes, the hunger drive, etc., etc., I hope we all someday arrive at accepting the existence of God. And should we do so, the next question then is how to travel down the chain of continuity and revelation and arrive at the religion of truth. That is much of what I have spoken about and what I will speak about in other episodes of this uh, series, Interfaith Issues. So I thank you for being with me tonight or today and hope that you will join us next time. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown. Until next time, this is Dr. Brown sending you the greeting of peace. I feel the peace, feel the peace inside, of me. inside of me, a complete tranquility. I remember.